So women's fashion is a window into women's autonomy and collective agency. Auckland fashion between the 1920s and 1940s is an example of this, and it's what I've spent my summer researching. Before I get started, I just wanted to thank Jonathan and Mary Mason for their scholarship funding my research, as well as Dr. Jess Parr and Dr. Linda Bryder for being really great supervisors, as well as the Auckland Libraries for their assistance in providing resources, especially those from the Mirror Magazine, which you'll see popping up again and again in my presentation today. So this quote here, what on earth have they in store for us next, was posed in a 1947 issue of the Mirror, summarizing a lot of women's thoughts on fashion at the time. Throughout the early 20th century, fashion was changing dramatically, making it impossible for women to consider what they were going to be wearing next. Today, I won't talk about where fashion went after 1947, but I will take you through on what Auckland fashion was doing from the 1920s to the 1940s. So the 1920s, 1930s and 1940s were a very distinct time in the evolution of fashion. Included in this 30 year time span is an economic boom after the First World War, then the Great Depression followed by the Second World War. There's a lot of world events happening in quite a short period of time and the world's uncertainty carried through to the fashion world. Before the early 20th century, fashion had been very rigid. What women were allowed to wear was very limited and for the most part, didn't leave room for much creativity. But from the 1920s, fashion changed. Department stores became a key place to buy clothing from, shops had more variety, and it became a goal to be in trend or in style. This meant changes both to the fashion industry and to women. For Auckland women, they heard about these fashion changes through one key source, the Mirror magazine. The Mirror, originally called the Ladies Mirror, discussed everything for women. Homemaking, recipes, beauty, celebrity gossip, and most importantly for us today, fashion. In the 1920s to 1940s, Paris and London were the fashion capitals of the Western world, and the Mirror would bring news of these places to Auckland, ensuring that all the way over in New Zealand, women could be up to date with the fashion whims of the world. From the beginning of the 20th century, Auckland women would purchase all of their fashion from department stores. There were six department stores in the heart of the city, Rendell's and George Court on Karangahape Road, Smith and Coe, Milne and Choice, and John Court on Queen Street, and Farmers Trading Company or Farmers on Hobson Street. Department store shopping was more than just a necessary trip to buy clothes. It was an event and stores capitalized on this. They held fashion parades, had tea rooms in them, even children's play areas. Stores had, stores had links with the wider fashion world with Smith & Coe in particular capitalizing off their image as a fashion forward shop. They had buyers in London and Paris, so were always up to date with what was happening away on the continent. Farmers was probably the most well-known in terms of making shopping an experience. Farmers was the first store to have a free car parking area with their shop, um, and they even ran a free bus between Karangahape Road, Hobson Street, and Queen Street. This meant that shoppers could use this bus to get e easily between all six department stores, which turned shopping into an all-day event. This image shows part of their route in 1932, from Queen Street to Hobson Street and back. You can see the farmer's store marked by Farmer's Warehouse and also John Court on the map marked by JCL for John Court Limited. Here, we can see the John Court building in 1917, which today is actually a farmer's down on Queen Street at the corner of Victoria Street. The contents of the 1917 department store would have shared some similarities with the content of farmers today, but the original would have had, would have had a much larger sewing and fabric department compared to the non-existent one of this farmers. Most of these stores, the department stores, except farmers began as draperies in the late 19th century. This meant that their fabric and sewing areas were a priority. They stocked sewing machines, bulk fabrics, and all other trimmings needed to create fashionable clothing at home. During the early 20th century, many women continued to make their clothing at home, but there was a pointed rise in women buying ready to wear clothing. This meant that made to order and off the rack clothing became more successful parts of the department stores going forward. A couple of these department stores also evolved into what we think of as a department store today. Multi-storied with multiple departments, not necessarily somewhere to go for clothing. Before we move on to look at each decade in depth, it's important to look at some key periods, key, key themes for the time period as a whole, fashion freedom and skirt hemlines. This quote from the 1948 mirror summarizes it quite nicely. The length of women's skirts is world news. Hemlines vary dramatically from, 19, from the 1920s to the 1940s, and the mirror picked up on each one of these shifts, no matter how large or small. Shifting skirt hemlines went hand in hand with increasing fashion freedom. As women gained autonomy over their lives and their collective identity, they had more say on what they were wearing, resulting in this variance in skirt hems. So for most people, um, 
thinking about 1920s fashion recalls images of flappers, that classic super short skirt with tassels, feathers in the hair. Well, there were definitely feathers in the hair and tassels. Skirts for everyday wear were not that short, not by today's standards at least. Just before the 1920s, the world had undergone some changes. World War I had been devastating worldwide and the influenza pandemic had been devastating domestically. This required some changes to how society functioned, including women's gradual entry into the work workforce. Women took on a more active role in society, working more frequently and gaining a new freedom that carried through to fashion. This freedom immediately came through shorter skirts. Skirts remained firmly below the knee, but they usually exposed the ankle and went up to around the mid-calf. This was absolutely revolutionary at the time and marked the first step towards modern fashion as we know it today. The mirror discussed that there was also a relaxation of silhouettes during the 1920s. However, the amount of undergarments worn in this period tells a very different story. Corsets, girdles, petticoats, and more. Large selections of each of these were seen in catalogues from the department stores, giving women variety in these otherwise uncomfortable garments. I came across this quote in a mirror article from 1927 and found it quite cool. When in future years, some energetic historian sets out to write the last word on the evolutions of the world's fashions, he or she as the case may be, probably he, will need to ponder seriously over spring 1927. While I would call myself an energetic historian, I do happen to be a she. I also can't say that spring 1927 provided me with anything in particular to ponder about. <laughs> However, to people in the 1920s, the decade repetitively provided them with fashion changes that they hadn't expected. Skirts were still shorter than they had been before, and there were definitely some creative changes in the hats. And this photo from 1928 shows some of the interesting hats worn just after this quote was published. While magazines and shops created the basis of fashion ideas, the clothing that people were wearing out and about also helps us to understand 1920s fashion more clearly. One of the main Auckland events where the most fashionable clothes were shown off was the Ellerslie races. In the early 1920s, photos weren't often published to show clothes. Instead, magazines and newspapers would have long columns in the society pages describing what women were wearing. These were detailed down to the colors and materials of the dresses and the accessories worn alongside them. In the latter half of the decade and going forward, photos such as this one from the Auckland Weekly News became more common. In a way, the society pages with their descriptions and photographs were fashion influences long before social media was even a thing. Moving forward to the 1930s. In the midst of the Great Depression, skirt hemlines tumbled back towards the ground. There's no clear reason why this happened, but there are some theories. The main idea is that hemlines got longer as a reaction against the liberalism of the 1920s. When the Great Depression came and the economy declined, fashion designers tended to reach back towards the comforting long skirts of the past. The other theory is simply that those designing clothes in Paris got bored. <laughs> no matter how the new skirt lengths were decided, women were not happy and did not take this decision lightly. Newspapers such as the New Zealand Herald and the Auckland Star published great disapproval of the long skirts, giving details of the protests happening over in Paris. One article written by a doctor actually discussed that longer skirts were worse for your health. Um, it sounds a bit strange, but the reasoning was that shorter skirts exposed more of your skin to vitamin D to be absorbed, and also that longer skirts dragged more bacteria into your house. Definitely some interesting ideas, but it shows that women were willing to say anything to get away from the restrictive nature of long skirts. Through the 1930s, the mirror was still the main place that Auckland women would go to get their fashion, fashion news. In the 1930s, the mirror had a monthly column on Parisian fashion written by a New Zealander living in Paris. These strong links with the Western world's fashion capital meant that all the way in New Zealand, Auckland women could feel connected to a wider world of fashion. Department stores such as Milne and Choice used the pages of the mirror to advertise their clothes, including boasting about their links with the rest of the fashion world. The mirror's pattern service in particular provided accessible ways for Auckland women to be in fashion. Women would send in the coupon seen in the bottom right um, to the mirror and would receive the patterns in the mail, which then they could make. The department stores would have everything that women needed to make the clothes as well. These patterns pictured from 1933 a typical 1930s fashion. Skirts are slightly longer and are very high-waisted. There are belts around the waists, hats are small, and shoulder pads are huge. Now the 1940s. Unsurprisingly, the first half of the 1940s was dominated by the Second World War. Import restrictions, labour shortages, and material shortages meant that at the beginning of the decade, fashion was not in a good place. The main fashion impact of the Second World War in New Zealand was clothing rationing. This was introduced domestically in May 1942. Each adult received 26 coupons per half year, which was supposed to be a sustainable level for all classes. 
Department stores were significantly impacted during this time period. There was an understandable decrease in business. There was less material, material available to make clothes out of and also less people buying clothes on a regular basis. Advertisements now also had money prices and coupon prices displayed as seen in this farmer's ad from 1943. You can see for this dress, it would have been four coupons. Um, restrictions on textiles also meant that most women changed their mindset around clothing. The Mirror published less fashion content during and after the war. What they did publish encouraged women to wear what they already had. Where women were previously encouraged to wear feminine, stylish, and unique clothes, they were now encouraged to wear functional, durable, and adaptable clothes. One word that continues to pop up through 1940s fashion is utilitarian. Clothes were made to be worn and they were made to have utility. The 1940s also saw some exciting changes to fashion. Trousers became a slightly more acceptable option for women to wear regularly. Previously, they had just been for sports, but from the 1940s, they started to become fashionable as everyday lives for women became more active. From the 1940s, we also begin, begin to see bikinis. They were far from the most popular option, but they were there, marking a significant departure from the conservatism that had been present all the way to this point. Also, perhaps most excitingly, women's clothes had pockets. I think that this is something that fashion designers now should take some hints from. I mean, I've got no pockets on what I'm wearing. Um, women's clothes still have a significant lack of pockets, in my opinion. But really, why does this matter at all? Are skirt lengths, magazines, and department stores really that important? Yes, of course. And there are a few key reasons. Firstly, clothing through the 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s reflected important changes in women's liberation. Shifts up and down in skirt lengths and changes in silhouettes went alongside women's gain in personal and collective autonomy. Beyond personal aut autonomy, fashion also shows, showed women banding together and gaining agency as a group. As a whole, changing fashion ideals marked an important direction in the future of gender equality. Also, looking at the fashion of the past gives us interesting ideas about how and why people bought clothes. Department stores were the main shopping destination at the time, but now they aren't. From that earlier list of six department stores, only Farmers and Smith & Coey are still in business. Farmers has become a nationwide mega department store, and Smith & Coey has just two locations, one of which is seen here, in their original location on Queen Street, as seen in this photo I took last week. <laughs> Shopping for fashion has changed dramatically since the early 20th century, so it can be really interesting as a modern consumer to see how our shopping habits have changed. We can even think of the future this way. What's the fate of the clothing store today as online shopping becomes more common? We can also use this case study to think about how world events shaped what people wore. As women worked more, skirts got shorter. As world wars started, people bought less clothing. As women became more active, they began to wear trousers. The list goes on. Seeing the correlation in the 20th century can help us to pay attention to how the world shapes our fashion decisions nowadays. So throughout the 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s, Auckland women undeniably proved that fashion was important and that it was a crucial part of how society and the economy functioned. As we continue on through the 21st century, we can look back at fashion to see where it all came from. We can also look forward wondering once again, what on earth is in store for us next? Thank you.